Wonderful. Great. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, today, I'm very excited to share with you my team's work on Extreme IoT. Now, when I say IoT, a lot of us might think about consumer products like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, or we might even think about our earbuds or smart lamps and about the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth that connects them. But today, I'm not going to be talking about this. Uh, what I want to tell you about is what I believe is the next generation of IoT, which we call Extreme IoT. I will be telling you about wireless and sensor technologies that my team has been developing for oceans, health, and robotics. And let me start by telling you why we need these technologies. So if we start with oceans, as of 2018, more than 80% of the ocean has never been observed or explored. 80%. And what that means is that we know more about the surface of the moon and the surface of Mars, of Mars than we know about the depth of our ocean. Let us shift gears and talk about the human body. Over the past few years, we've seen amazing advances in health wearables like Fitbit and Apple Watch. And these wearables have really advanced our lives and the way we understand our health. But they don't tell us a lot of information that we want. So for example, today I'm feeling a little bit under the weather and I'm thinking, am I getting sick? Am I recovering? Do I have coronavirus? Today's wearables cannot give us this information. And beyond oceans and the human body, if we take, uh, if we look at our robots, today's robots are limited in their ability to perceive the world around them. Even when we build our best robots, we want them to do things and perceive the world like us humans. But what if we could make robots see things that are invisible to the human eye? What do all of these problems have in common? All of them show that today's sensor and IoT technologies are unable to extract important information that we need from the physical world, whether the physical world underwater uh, or inside our body or even for robotics. And today, what I want to share with you is where I believe the next leap will IoT, in IoT is going to be and how it allows us to overcome these problems. I'll be telling you about uh, my team's work on extreme IoT and sensor technologies. And the reason I call them extreme is that they will be interweaved in the fabric of our physical world in ways that have been unprecedented before. I will tell you about our work for oceans and climate, for health and the human body, and for robotics and supply chain. And let us start with oceans. As I mentioned before, Today, more than 80% of the ocean has never been observed or explored. And over the past few years, my team has been on a mission to take the Internet of Things in order for us to explore the underwater world. So you might be wondering why we want to explore it. And the reason is because there's enormous scientific value. So for example, an underwater IoT can allow us to deploy sensors in the ocean and have them transmit their information back to us. For example, they may send us back images and sounds of animals so that we may explore the ocean, or of coral reefs so that we can uh, monitor underwater climate and its impact on coral reefs. And underwater IoT can also play a key role in food security. According to the United Nations, aquaculture or fish farming will be the fastest growing food sector over the next 30 years, and it is expected to fill the gap between the supply and demand for food. So if we want to feed the world's population, we need to get aquaculture right. And an ocean IoT would allow us to do exactly that, to monitor aquaculture environments in real time, optimize feeding patterns, and intervene whenever we detect uh, harmful environmental hazards like algae blooms. And there's so many other applications for underwater IoT, ranging from underwater robotics to mining, weather prediction, defense, and disaster response. And we can enab enable all of these applications if we can build an underwater IoT. But we're not there yet. In fact, today, less than one in a million IoT devices is underwater, even though our oceans cover more than 70% of our planet. And a few years ago, my, my team and I started thinking about how we can bring the Internet of Things underwater. And as we started thinking about how we could deploy sensors underwater and collect data and have them transmit for a long period of time, we faced a problem. And the problem was that the battery life of underwater sensors is extremely limited. As we look deeper into this problem, we realize that the reason is that underwater transmissions consume significant power, 
typically today's underwater modems consume about tens to hundreds of watt. And not only this, unlike typical IoT sensors where, for example, you can, I can take my phone, I can recharge it easily, or I can recharge my Fitbit, you cannot easily recharge underwater sensors. If, you, if the sensor has a battery and you want to recharge it, you need to send the research vessel, pay thirty to seven to $70,000 per day uh, in order for you to go replace the battery and come back. And because of this, state-of-the-art sensors for tracking marine animals can only last for a few hours or a day, uh, or a few days after which their batteries die. And over the past few, few years, engineers have made a sort of amazing workarounds to try to duty cycle them. But once you start duty cycle, cycling them, the amount of information that you can extract becomes so low. And it makes it very difficult to use a lot of these sensors for long-term climate monitoring or discovering migration patterns of marine animals. And this got us thinking about ways to reduce the power consumption of underwater communication. And today, I want to share with you how we can overcome these problems with a new technology that my team has been developing that enables underwater backscatter networking. The cool thing about this type of communication technology is that it consumes net zero power. And what that does is that it enables our sensors to operate over a very long period of time without requiring any batteries. Let me describe to you how our technology works by comparing it to traditional underwater communications. So in many of these environments, you typically have a base station that is uh, near the shore, and it wants to communicate with a lot of these sensors. So uh, for simplicity, let's just focus on one sensor. Let's, for example, say there's a temperature sensor. And for those of you who are not familiar, underwater, we cannot use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth because they rely on radio signals, which die very fast in water. And so, for example, if the temperature sensor wants to communicate with the receiver, it has to use acoustic signals or sound. So the sensor has a speaker and the receiver has a hydrophone or an underwater microphone. And the sensor encodes information using sound and transmits it to a speaker. Now, the problem with this approach is that generating acoustic signals requires a lot of energy, which drains the sensor's battery, which is why you need to go in and replace it. In contrast, in our technology, the sensor does not need to generate its acoustic signal. And let me tell you how it works. In our design, the speaker and the hydrophone are both placed near the shore. And our sensor simply has a reflector, which you can think of as a mirror. So now, if the speaker near the shore transmits an acoustic signal, it will reflect off this reflector and it will come back. Now, in order to communicate information, all the sensor needs to do is to toggle its reflector between reflective and non-reflective states. And once it can toggle between two states, it can communicate bits of zeros and one, and that allows you to send any sensor data. So to summarize, in traditional communication, a sensor must generate its own acoustic signal, which is power consuming, while in our technology, it only needs to turn a switch on and off. And you might be wondering, well, but now doesn't the, the uh, speaker near, near the shore need more power? And the answer is yes, but that is exactly what I wanted to do. Since near the shore, you have easy access to uh, a power source. This allows us to shift all the energy consumption to the shore and away from the sensor and make our sensor entirely battery free. And this same idea can be extended to all the different sensors that are underwater uh, that I told you about. And they can allow and it allows us to communicate with the remote receiver. Now, all of this is great, but the main question is how can we control the reflections of acoustic signals? So our idea is to use piezo electricity to design programmable acoustic reflectors. And for those of you who are not familiar, the piezoelectric effect refers to the ability of certain materials to transform mechanical energy into electrical energy. And let me explain this using a simple example. So let us say that we have uh, a piezoelectric material and we try to measure the electric voltage across this material. Now, if you have a speaker and the speaker transmits sound, sound travels as a pressure wave. So when it hits the piezoelectric material, the material starts vibrating and this vibration creates an electric signal at the terminals of the material. So effectively, 
the material has transformed mechanical energy, which is sound, into electrical energy, which is voltage. Now remember, what I want to do is to transform this material to a reflector. And to do this, what I'm going to do is to simply add a switch. When the switch is open, the material behaves exactly the same as before, and it transforms acoustic signals into an electric signal. But let us see what happens when the switch is closed. When the switch is closed, it means that two, the two terminals of the material can, can, are connected to each other. And when the terminals are connected, you cannot have any voltage, and so the device cannot vibrate. So if you transmit an acoustic signal, where does the energy go? It has to be entirely reflected back. And so by closing the switch, we're able to transform the piezoelectric material into a reflector. And to communicate now, all we need to do is to switch between reflective and non-reflective states. And this can be done using a simple transistor. And in this way, the sensor can communicate without generating uh, the, the power-consuming acoustic signal. Now, of course, what I described to you here is a very simplified uh, a description of how the technology works, and I invite you to read our papers um, for more details. We call this technology piezoacoustic backscatter because it uses the piezoelectric, refle uh, the piezoelectric effect in order for it to communicate by reflection or backscatter. And what we show is that our sensor needs a million times less power of the order of um, 100 microwatts at most, and even less now, uh, which is much lower than standard underwater acoustic modems, modems. And not only this, our sensor can also harvest energy in the non-reflective or the absorptive states, which allows it to be completely battery-free. So I've been telling you about our technology. Let me show it to you in action uh, by showing you one of the first prototypes that we built and tested uh, in our lab. So over here, the, I'm going to show you a clip which was shot in a large experimental pool. At the far end of this pool, you can see the hydrophone receiver and our projector or speaker. And here is our sensor um, connected to the circuit, which has an LED. Now, let me play the video. And notice how when I play the video, the LED lights up. Remember that our sensor does not have any battery. So the LED lights up entirely based on the harvested acoustic signals. And what this shows is that we're able to power up our sensor remotely. Next, let me show you how we can, our sensor can communicate and we can decode its response. So we use the hydrophone to measure the received signal. And let me show you what we got. Over here, I plot the uh, normalized amplitude on the y-axis as a function of time on the x-axis. And this is the signal, uh, the orange is the signal that we received. At about two and a half seconds, the speaker starts transmitting and uh, so we see a jump in the, in the power of the signal. And about three seconds, a little bit after three seconds, you start seeing that the amplitude switches between two different levels, which correspond to the backscatter signal. And what this shows is that our hydrophone can sense these amplitude changes, and it can use them in order to decode the backscatter packets. Now, now, you might be wondering, how come this amplitude does not go entirely to zero when the sensor is in the absorptive state? And remember that the hydrophone doesn't only get the reflection, but it also gets the direct signal from the speaker, which is never zero. And over the past few years, we've built on this basic idea with a number of algorithms and techniques to scale to many nodes, deal with other reflections in the environment, uh, and so on. So for example, uh, not only can you transmit between reflective and non-reflective, you can also apply a code. And by applying a code, you can start having, I mean, think of it like a CDMA code that allows you to extract the signal from the noise, that allows you to deal with multiple transmissions at the same time, that allows you to isolate between the static reflectors, reflections, and these modulated reflections, and encode information and allow multiple concurrent transmissions. Um, so, here uh, you can see actually our sensor. We fabricated um, and uh, printed this, this 3D sensor. One of the questions, I have actually one of them here. You can see it, I'm holding it in my hand. Um, one of the questions that I also often get is, how does the, the mirror or how does the reflector know from which direction the signal is coming? And the basic idea is, remember that I, I tried to explain it as a simplified example, but actually this, uh, this transducer is omnidirectional in the horizontal plane. And if you were to design it as a sphere, you can also make it omnidirectional, omnidirectional in 3D. 
Um, and so we, we build these in-house. We also build the hardware for uh, energy harvesting, for bi-directional communication, and uh, as well as the ability to integrate these with an external sensor. And one of the really cool things about this is that not only is this sensor very low power, but it's also pretty cheap to build. Our sensor costs, uh, if you want to build this entire thing, it costs about $100, which is uh, for uh, any of you working in oceanography, you all know that today's underwater uh, transducers, sort of ruggedized devices, are very expensive. Um, but you can build these sensors battery-free, ultra-low power um, at, a very, uh, at a very low cost. And it consumes uh, a, uh, about 100 uh, microwatts, which is a million times less power than state-of-the-art modems, even when it communicates at the same type of throughput. And we've been experimenting uh, with this technology. Uh, for example, here you can see some of my students experimenting, uh, doing experiments in the Charles River, including in snow and rain. Uh, we've run hundreds of experimental trials at different ranges, throughputs, and number of nodes. And we've demonstrated that we can achieve throughputs up to 20 kilobits per second, which is pretty high, uh, sort of on the high end of what you can achieve in underwater acoustic communication. Um, we started with about uh, sort of few centimeters, we went on to a few meters, now we're able to achieve 62 meters. Uh, and we're only starting with this technology. And, and so there's so many opportunities to be able to extend it to hundreds of meters or even kilometers as the technology develops. And we've also demonstrated that you can enable concurrent communication with at least 10 nodes, and this is even before spatial reuse. And we've even taken it a step further and shown how you could use these sensors not just to communicate, but also to enable localization. So you can enable things like underwater GPS by using these sensors as anchors, and you can achieve centimeter scale localization. And the reason why this is so important is to remember that radio signals do not work underwater. So for example, Similar to how Wi-Fi and Bluetooth do not work underwater, GPS also does not work underwater. And now you can build a batteryless GPS using these types of technologies. And we've been also taking our research out of the lab. So here you can see a couple of my uh, undergrads running experiments in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, here they have a, a sensor node, which is also connected with uh, a temperature and sensor and pressure sensor. And these are important for monitoring temperature changes underwater, as well as uh, changes in sea level rises. And one of the exciting applications of our technology even extends beyond our planets. Uh, so NASA scientists recently discovered subsurface oceans in Saturn's moon Titan. So you can imagine using this technology in future space missions in order to look for and sample water in distant planets and potentially look for life in outer space. And recently, uh, this technology was also highlighted as an ocean shot for the, this decade, um, uh, 2021 to 2030, by the US National Academy's uh, Committee on Ocean Sciences. And this technology is super exciting because of its applications, but also it's so exciting because of the many opportunities and open problems. So I started by telling you about underwater IoT, but remember that the reason we want to build an, this IoT is because we want to be able to collect data and use it for modeling. So for example, once you have your, you're able to deploy these sensors for a long time, you can start using them for weather prediction, um, uh, flood and disaster uh, response, climate mod modeling, understanding coral reefs. You can also use them for underwater drone localization and navigation and open up so many, so many new applications in mapping, um, mining and defense. And there's also exciting potential developments architecturally. How do you build these multi-hop architectures? Uh, what are the types of simulations that we need to build uh, to operate with the acoustics, but also with the electronics and with the mechanical components? How can we extend the range and reduce the power consumption? Because actually in the limit, the power consumption of this type of technology should even be in the nanowatts. So how can we achieve that uh, over the next few years? And in order to open this up to other researchers, uh, recognizing that this is really a full stack technology, my team has released the code and the schematics and even step-by-step -step tutorials for anyone who is interested in building these from scratch, um, uh, both with the sort of the transducer itself, as well as the electronics and uh, the higher level communication protocols. And we're pushing forward with uh, building sensors to monitor climate change, temperature, animals, coral reefs, underwater GPS, uh, also last year, I organized along with uh, colleagues at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, a, uh, a conference that was sponsored by the National Science Foundation uh, called Smart Oceans 2020, 
where we thought together about how we can accelerate uh, the field forward and bring uh, the Internet of Things to underwater environments. We had uh, thousands, more than a thousand people registered from 400 institutions. And uh, then we went ahead and we proposed with the National Science Foundation that we want to open uh, a new track uh, for funding. And because of this, actually, just last week, um, the National Science Foundation uh, opened up uh, tens of millions of dollars for industry academic collaborations, specifically for what we proposed, which was the network blue economy. And for any of the of you who are interested, I invite you to check it out and to apply for grants, uh, which are called these are called convergence grants, and uh, the letters of intent uh, are due by uh, by May five. So it's a very exciting space uh, that. Um, we were on board with the NSF to accelerate it forward, and there's so many opportunities um, for, for many of us to be able to contribute. And so, so far, I've been telling you about the exciting work uh, that, that I love in uh, that we've been doing on oceans. Uh, but remember that I also want to be able to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in the context of health and the human body, as well as in robotics. Uh, and so what I want to tell you next is about our research in the human body. Now, about a couple of years ago, I was watching this, uh, the World Mobile Conference, and I saw this uh, person who received uh, uh, an underchip implant uh, live under his skin at the World Mobile, Mobile Conference. But the micro implant that he got at the time was very limited. It could only be implanted at superficial depth, and the only thing that you could, you could use it for is to identify the person. In fact, in a recent op-ed uh, article in Popular Science, someone who received a similar implant wrote, my implant is both less scary and less useful than you might think. And while impl implants right under the skin might not be very useful, if you can take them and put them deep inside the human body, they have enormous applications in digital medicine. So over the past few years, my team and I have been uh, on, on a, also a mission to take micro implants like this one, which have no batteries, and put them deep inside the human body. And we want to be able to communicate with them from outside the body. So how do we power them up and communicate with them when they have no batteries? Again, our idea is to uh, use wireless power and communication. So you, you transmit a wireless signal, they harvest energy from it, they power up, and they communicate. And if we're able to do so from a distance outside the body, then it opens up so many applications in digital health, which are also very user-friendly because people don't need to wear uh, sort of these uh, uh, the, the power source on the body, and it can even be setting, for example, by a bedside. So, uh, for example, uh, it, they could be used for continuous sensing of tumors and biomarkers. You can imagine in the future a network of miniature sensors inside the body, sensing conditions and sens sending the inf this information to the outside world. For example, they can continuously monitor a person's gut microbiome or stomach condition. And uh, maybe in the future, if I'm at a higher risk of getting uh, COVID, I could swallow a micro implant. And if it detects it, it automatically alerts me and tells me that I need to isolate. And that enables early intervention because you can monitor the human body from the inside. And there's also a lot of other applications. So, for example, uh, ultra long lasting drug delivery. Today, when you take a pill, you envision that it immediately releases the drug inside the body. But there's so many applications where you need to be able to release the drug over an extended period of time. So, for example, with a technology like this, a person can swallow a micro implant that expands inside the body and then it can start releasing uh, a drug over an extended period of time. And if someone forgets to take their medication, it can also detect that and release the medication. And that has so many applications for improving medical adherence, especially with patients with Alzheimer's who forget to take their medications. And so all of this is, are very exciting applications, but remember that there's a problem, which is that with today's sort of RF micro implants, you cannot power them deep inside the human body and you cannot do it from a distance. And so what, we've, what my team has also been doing is building technologies that can remotely power up and communicate with deep tissue, batteryless and intelligent micro implants. And one of the unique things about what we can do is that we can do it from a distance. So you could, for example, as I mentioned, have a device that sits by a person's desk or by their bedside uh, and do that without contact with the person's body. And a person just has to sort of have the batteryless micro implant. But one of the key challenges in enabling this is that if you're relying on RF signals, uh, these wireless signals die exponentially inside the human body. 
So if you take a device and it transmits a signal from outside the body, the signal is going to attenuate very fast in the body. In fact, signals inside the body uh, decay more than a thousand times faster than in air. And as a result, by the time the signal reaches a microimplant, it is too weak to power it up. And it, this is what prevented existing technologies from being able to power up in deep tissues from a distance. And so we've been thinking about how we can power up and communicate with sensors in deep tissues, despite the uh, attenuation uh, and complexity. And uh, over the past few years, we've been trying to address this problem from different perspectives. So uh, what we've been doing is we've been developing these beam focusing or, or beam forming technologies uh, that are safe and that can deliver sufficient energy uh, to inside the human body while being blind to channel conditions. And for those of you on, who have worked on, on the theoretical side, this is inspired by blind beam forming, but in contrast to existing approaches on blind beam forming where you need, you're either doing it at the receiver or you need some level of cooperation, we're doing this with uh, micro implants that are batteryless. And so you, we're addressing the hard problem of cold start um, in beam forming. And we've also, we're also been addressing this from inside the body. So we've been building these uh, flexible and reconfigurable micro implants that can adapt to in-body conditions. Uh, because, for example, even if you take a, the same micro implant as it moves inside the body, it is impacted by surrounding tissues and it needs to, uh, to adapt to them. So, for example, over here, you can see one of our uh, latest uh, devices. Here you can see a microchip that we built, uh, and we built it on a flexible um, antenna, uh, on a programmable antenna with a flexible substrate. And uh, this flexible uh, sort of a PCB can be laminated on uh, on an organ or it can be rolled into a pill form. And we've also been working with some of our collaborators in incorporating them into pills that can expand once, for example, they, they reach the target tissue and then self-destroy and leave the body. Uh, and these microchips are pretty complex. They have, uh, they can reprogram the antenna so that they can adapt to different environments. They have tunable matching, uh, logic, uh, energy harvesting, as well as power management. Um, and we've also, what we've shown is that uh, these micro implants consume 350 nanowatts. So this is pretty low power and we're pushing this power even lower. Uh, they can achieve pretty high throughput of six megabits per second. So you can imagine even streaming things like images uh, from inside the body and they can adapt to surrounding tissues, which is also pretty hard because human tissues are very complex. And we've been working with our medical collaborators at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital to evaluate these in living animals. So for example, we've uh, evaluated them inside a living pig, both under the skin and inside the stomach. And we've had successful demonstrations of our ability to wirelessly power and communicate with these micro implants from a distance, despite that they, they are in deep tissues. And this is super exciting because it opens up so many applications. Um, so we've demonstrated the ability to power them up, but uh, there's applications in being able to locate them as they travel inside the body, being able to do nanosensing stimulation, in new, new, being able to deliver, build new types of drugs that can sense and react uh, and to enable long-term monitoring. So it's an exciting long-term vision of what we could do now that we're able to, to open up these applications. And one of the other uh, exciting things is that uh, it opens up big questions on how you can maintain the security and privacy uh, of these types of uh, micro implants, which is also an open problem. And we need to be able to secure the digital health of, uh, of this, these biomarkers coming from inside the body. And so, so far I've been telling you about extreme IoT inside the human body. I wanna quickly shift gears uh, to things that you could do from a distance without touching the person's body in any way. So going from sort of this extremely invasive, invasive to completely non-invasive technologies. And in this context, what my team has been working on is building these sensors that can sense the human body without any sensor. So for example, you can take a wireless device, put it in the environment, and without having to swallow any pill, without having to put anything on the person's body, this wireless device can use wireless signals in the environment in order to monitor a person's vital signs. So in this video, I'm gonna play the video and you'll see the output of our device on the left. You can see that it is able to 
monitor the person's uh, breathing. Uh, and for example, when the person will hold their breath in a bit, you will stop seeing these variations in the environment. And the reason is that when the person holds their breath, they stop impacting the wireless signals in the environment. And when you do that, you're able to register this. But when the person will release their breath in a bit, you will start seeing these variations happening again. And as I said, we're doing this type of sensing without any sensor on the person's body. Now, to show this more visually, I will take this video and I will play it at five times the speed. And I want you to look at the person's chest and match it to the signal. Uh, and so as you can see, this device is able to monitor the person's breathing. It's always weird for me to be talking about this person in third person because this was me when I was a, a, a PhD student a few years ago, and this technology uh, was, and I was the subject of the of this sensor. And in fact, you could even take this a bit further. So for example, one of the most exciting applications of this technology is in a baby monitor. Today, if you take, uh, uh, this is the output of a baby monitor. So if you look at the top left, you see that time is passing. But when you look at the output of the baby monitor, all you see is a still image. And so what we did a few years ago is we took this and we augmented it with the output of our technology. And what we showed is that you're able to monitor the baby's breathing in real time, and you're even able to monitor the baby's heart rate. So for example, here, the heart rate is uh, 126 beats per minute. And now it's 127. And uh, this is actually normal for a, a baby this age because infants of this age have, have a relatively high heart rate. And over the past few years, we've been developing this technology uh, and we've, uh, we've commercialized it. We have a, a startup that, and it's currently being used to monitor patients with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and COVID-19. Now for COVID-19, it might be clear because COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. So you're, you're able to monitor uh, a disease progression by monitoring how the person's respiration is evolving over time. But the reason it's also able to monitor patients, for example, with Parkinson's, is that not only are we able to, to monitor breathing, but you're also able to monitor small movements, for example, when uh, that, that are resulting from a, a sort of certain shaking, and you're able to monitor how people's uh, um, change, adapt to, uh, to drugs that they're taking, and how this adaptation, how certain drugs are helping uh, with disease progression. And because of this, a few years ago, um, we were invited to the White House, uh, to demo this to, to President Obama. And uh, actually the video of that demo is, uh, is available online. And if you were to go and check it out, uh, you'll see that my um, friend Zach here uh, starts in the middle of the demo, starts laughing. And the reason is I was the subject of the, of the demo and he was monitoring the output of the heart rate and he saw that the heart rate that our device was showing was over a hundred, which is pretty expected when you're demoing to the president uh, in the White House. And with this technology being uh, commercialized, uh, my team and I have been thinking about how we can take this a step further, not just to monitor breathing and, and uh, heart rate, but also we started thinking about whether we can capture entire heart recordings. And what I wanna share with you now is uh, how uh, one of our uh, recent, uh, quickly give you a glimpse of, again, it uses these reflections and it is able to measure the micro vibrations from the person's body. And by measuring these micro vibrations, we're able to extract microcardiac events. So in one of our most recent papers, we showed that we're able to extract different microcardiac events, such as uh, the aortic valve opening and closing or the mitral valve uh, opening and closing or isovolumetric contractions. So not only can we track people's movements or breathing or heart rate, we can even time microcardiac events with very high accuracy. And this opens up a whole set of new applications in long-term cardiovascular monitoring and intervention uh, with, uh, for different types of diseases. And we've been working with our collaborators at Mass General Hospital in order for us to bring these technologies closer to the home and be able to perform long-term monitoring. And so uh, uh, with this, uh, so far I've told you about my team's work on the health and the human body, as well as on oceans. 
I want to briefly touch on some of the work that we've been doing also in Xtreme and IoT and sensor technologies in the context of robotics. And for those, for those of you who are worried, don't worry, this last part is going to be shorter than the previous two ones, so uh, we'll let you leave on time. And uh, as I mentioned, in the context of robotics, we've been sort of asking, uh, we've been very inspired by the, the amazing work that has happened in the vision community um, in terms of robotic perception and manipulation. But we've been asking questions, a different type of question, which is, can we enable robots to perceive things that are invisible to the human eye? So for example, in supply chain, there's a lot of applications uh, where a robot needs to know what is inside a closed box for quality assurance purposes or quality control. Uh, when it comes to food security, there's applications where, can I know whether the food or medicine inside a closed bottle is safe? Um, and in the context of robotic manipulation, for example, there's questions along the lines of, can we, sorry, can we enable a robot to fetch or grasp things that it cannot see? And the good thing is that the answer to all of these questions is yes. And the way we do this is that we augment robots with wireless perception. And the basic idea here is that unlike vision, radio frequency or RF signals can traverse everyday occlusions. And because they can traverse occlusions, which are typically uh, uh, occlusions for light, they allow us to extend perception beyond the line of sight. So let me show you a video of what we can do by combining vision with RF perception. So over here, for example, we have a, a robotic arm, and the robotic arm wants to be able to find and grasp a target item that is under occlusion. So this item is inside the box and it's under occlusion. In fact, the camera's line of sight is blocked, and if you were to look at it, the camera is pointing in a completely different direction. The camera is pointing toward this other box here. So uh, if this robot wants to go and grasp the item of interest, it does not even know where it has to start, let alone be able to perceive and locate the object. And what I want to briefly tell you about is how we enable this robot to navigate around occlusions, declutter the environment, go back, find the item of interest, and pick it up. So how do we do this? Well, the way we do this is that we, as I mentioned, we add RF perception. So we use this, these antennas here, here that you can see, and the item of interest is tagged with an RFID. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar. For those of you who are not familiar, RFID are stickers like this one. Uh, there is, they cost about three cents. There's a 30 billion UHF RFIDs like this already in today's world. Uh, and uh, we might be even wearing them on our bodies because the vast, so many retailers have already adopted them. And so what we do, this is the output of RF perception in 3D. So this is what the, the antennas perceive, how they perceive. So they transmit a wireless signal, which traverses the occlusions and it is able to locate the object in 3D. And once we're able to locate the object, the camera still is not able to see it, but because the uh, uh, because you know the robot now knows where the object is, it can navigate around obstacles and it fuses RF and vision together. And then it sort of it's over the object. It knows that it is there and it is not able to see it. So because it knows that it is there, it goes ahead and it declutters the environment. So it removes the cover that was on top of the object, puts it to the side, realizes it did not pick up the item of interest, and it goes back and picks it up. And once it picks up the object, it can even know that it picks it up because the RF perception is able to track it. And so it knows when the, when the grasp has been successful. And so what I showed you here is sort of the progression over, uh, over things that we've done over the past five years in being able to enable micro location and also fusing it with vision. Uh, and we'll, but this specific demo is from a, 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 an ICRA paper that is uh, coming out uh, later this year. And uh, with this, I've told you about uh, my team's work on extreme IoT and sensor technologies in the ocean, the human body, and robotics. Uh, and of course, none of this would have been possible without uh, the amazing uh, students, uh, postdocs, and researchers that you can see uh, here in the, uh, in the um, image. Um, and along with our collaborators, we think about uh, uh, what are the ways in which we can explore the world um, and how we can decode hidden worlds uh, 
uh, with the ultimate with the ultimate goal to contributing to societal to societal problems. And what I want to wrap up my talk by saying is that this research is super exciting for me because on one hand it involves deep technical challenges and it makes connections between fields, but also on the other hand it opens up so many powerful applications and. Uh, uh, ranging uh, from helping us understand and address humanity's existential climate cl uh, uh, crisis, climate change, uh, to building new tools for monitoring and treating diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and even cancer, and paves way for potential future application in space exploration. And with this, I want to wrap up my talk. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm uh, more than happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Adi, for this great and very exciting talk. And now we are open to uh, questions. Well, actually, I noticed that there's already uh, several questions in the in the chat window, so I'm uh, going to read uh, those questions uh, to Professor uh, Adi. So I think the first question is from Philip Cox, uh, sent at 7:25 p.m. Uh, the question is. How can you use how can you use acoustic communications without interfering with uh, and disturbing marine mammals? I think that's a great question. I love this question. I think it's a fantastic question. So there's two things. First, most many marine animals usually operate in a certain acoustic range. Mm, let's say it's usually sub ten k sub ten kilohertz. And one of the things that we've been working on is operating sort of at a, at a higher frequency, uh, which is typically closer to twenty kilohertz. So it's for many of them, or for the vast majority of them, actually, if not all, this is in the ultrasonic range. Um, and so you're not, you're, you're trying not to disturb them. But one of the most important things, actually, is by reducing the power consumption of underwater communication, we can go ahead and build on the amazing literature that has been done in acoustic communication over the past sort of 50 years, but reduce the power consumption a lot to the extent that we might even be using the sounds of animals in order for us to power up these sensors because they use such low power. And then you can use it to communicate even below sort of uh, uh, the noise floor of what these, uh, uh, what animals are communicating with. So one of the exciting directions is uh, to be able to harvest energy from, let's say, dolphin uh, sound in order for you to be able to monitor them and also uh, uh, be able to uh, communicate without disturbing them because currently noise pollution is a big problem and that is what has been uh, sort of motivating us to operate in the near ultrasound or in the ultrasonic range. So great question. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, let me add something to the to, to the answers um, because I, my research area is also actually I did a lot of work in uh, underwater uh, networking. Uh, so acoustic communication is uh, one of our, the, the focus. Uh, so compare with SONA. Okay, you know the the the, the navies they are using sonars for detection, finding, uh, trying to track other submarines, know where they are. Compared to sonar, the energy used by acoustic communication is almost neglectable. And then compare with uh, acoustic communication, you, you, uh, we are doing right now. Doctor uh, Adib's method use even less power. So I. Uh, from my point of view, I don't think that's that's gonna uh, disturb the the marine mammal uh, compared with all the things going on in the in the water. Okay, so um, let's look at the next question. The next question is from uh, Jagan De uh, Devkota. His question is, "What's the operating frequency?" Uh, I'm not sure he, if he's asking about the the acoustic. Com uh, Communication or the 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 body uh, talking to the communicating with the with the with the implant. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer both. Actually, okay. for um, uh, for uh, for acoustics, uh, we've been operating. Actually, we've shown that you can operate from 10 kilohertz to 60 kilohertz to 67 kilohertz. So we've also built meta materials that are that are wide band and high efficiency and they have sort of multiple resonances. And the the appro the design itself is pretty generic. So you could use it, you could customize it to different um, uh, to different frequency ranges. For the human body, we've been operating in the 900 megahertz range. And the, there is a reason for this. And the reason is because there's been research that has demonstrated that this is optimal for micro implants because it, it 
has the optimal uh, sort of uh, trade-off between the attenuation inside the human body on one hand and the, the efficiency of the micro implant because you typically want larger wavelength in order for you to be able to traverse deeper but uh, if you use very large wavelength then you need very large antennas and if, if you start using larger antennas uh, then uh, uh, then you cannot put them inside the body so you need smaller ones that become efficient and that is the sweet spot and there's been excellent research in this space that motivated us to use uh, some of these uh, by the way i also got some questions uh, privately in the chat and i'll be happy to also pick them up and answer them for folks uh, after the public questions have been uh, asked okay uh, so next question is from uh, zafar uh, the question is, how does the scatter is provided the uh, temperature, pre uh, pressure, etc. Uh, for oh, yeah. monitoring? Also, good question. So one of the things that I didn't talk about is we're pretty much building a full microcomputer for underwater. So we have a microprocessor and the microprocessor is being powered up by, by the energy harvester. And it's also connected to like via SPI, uh, SP or I2C to uh, like a, a temperature or a pressure sensor. Uh, and then it, so it powers them up, it extracts this information, it encodes it. We use, uh, for those of you who are familiar, we use FM0 modulation, and then we transmit this information back. But you could also think about analog sensors and analog backscatter. There's so many different things that could be done in this space. Okay, the next question uh, is from Jeff. He said, uh, several years ago, I had a, a capsule test, which consists of a, so swallowing a capsule that took pictures, and it moved through the internal uh, track, which transmitted uh, transmitting the image to a small receiver that I was wearing. So he's wondering if you have uh, looked at this, uh, this technology. Yes, wonderful. Thank you for the question. So uh, capsule endoscopes has been around, have been around for a while. One of the main challenges with a lot of these is that um, they sort of they have batteries and if they run out of battery, sometimes they get stuck in one out of five patients. And uh, if they get stuck in the patient and they run out of battery, you cannot even uh, uh, you cannot even detect them anymore. Uh, and they typically last, I think, for about maybe 48 hours and the battery takes about half of it. So all of these reasons are, imagine if you have a batteryless one, even if it gets stuck, you're able to detect it. Uh, uh, you can make the entire capsule smaller, or you can add even more functionality to the capsule. So there's been amazing work in um, sort of bioelectronics, building these bio electronics that are compatible with the human body, a lot of applications. And what we're doing is we're saying, look, you can take a lot of these applications and make them batteryless for sort of much better user experience one, but also to open up a larger number of new applications. Okay, great. Uh, although it's right, right now it's almost eight, but according to the agenda, uh, the Q and A lo uh, go until ten, uh, eight ten. So, f fellow, we're gonna roast you for another ten minutes. <laughs> I'll be more okay than happy. With that. Okay, so uh, next question. I think I, I think that's more like a comment from Tim. Uh, Tim said, uh, uh, "This is similar to how the the Russians bugged us, bugged the U.S. Uh, embassy." <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I, I, I love. I don't know if any of you have been watching, like, watch the Spycraft uh, Netflix uh, show. Uh, I've been uh, definitely uh, binging on Netflix uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, <laughs> and that is right. I actually teach it teach it in my class uh, uh, how the this is related to the to the bug. For those of you who are also familiar with. Uh, RFIDs, it is somehow also uh, similar to RFIDs, but it is today these technologies, because they rely on RF, they do not work underwater. And so what we figured out is how can you take batteryless, uh, uh, batteryless applications uh, uh, to underwater environments by sort of these piezoelectric backscatter sensors. So great comment, very insightful and 100% correct. Okay, next is from Randy. I think Randy is kind of uh, uh, ask a very, very uh, uh, question, ask a very interesting question. Uh, first comment from him is, uh, various, specify, various specifies in the water can be exceptional smart sensor platforms. Why contaminate the ocean with more human-made things when we have existing sensing platform? That's the first question. And the, the, the second question is, uh, there's a problem with acoustics as 
there are boundary regions that prevent seeing through or above this uh, boundary. I think, Randy, are you from the Navy? I think uh, I know the submar submariners. They know that in the in the water there's a, some some air some uh, areas. Uh, uh, some sometimes they call them ducts. That in that area, uh, your your acoustics propagates further. But if you can hide your submarine below that area, the sonar cannot get you. So I think that's uh, that's what the Randy's uh, that's that's related to Randy's uh, question. Uh, the second question. Right. I, I'd be happy to answer both of them. So the first question is, there are various, uh, sen I assume, sensors in the water that can use a smart sensing platform. The answer is yes and no, in the sense that, of course, there's been a lot of work over the past many decades on platforms. You know, it's similar to, uh, I have a radio tower and I want to communicate with, between radio towers. So this is like, a co like uh, uh, what is it called? A cellular communication between towers versus IoT, you know, my, my Fitbit with uh, with my access point. And the types of applications that these can enable are, are very different. In fact, if you speak people, to people in uh, climatology or like studying, let's say, air-sea interactions, um, then there's a lot of interest in being able to get fine-grained spatial temporal measurements over a wide area. And it is still hard to do a lot of these fine-grained spatial temporal measurements. And so what we've been thinking about is how you can bring these uh, these technologies, similar types of capabilities to underwater environments to open up a whole set of new capabilities at a low cost, at an ultra low power, whether it's in climate sensing, whether it's in aquaculture and, and so on and so forth, all of, all of which are emerging areas and the constraints are different. So from an engineering perspective, you need to take, take a step back and revisit a, a lot of these assumptions. The, qu the other question was also super good, which is why contaminate the, the ocean? And uh, usually also when, when, when I give some of these talks, I also talk about how can you, so uh, the piezos that we use, for example, have lead, have lead in them, which can contaminate, but how can we build, you build also biodegradable ones? Uh, and over the past few years, we've seen uh, the ability to do uh, piezoelectricity and folks in material science can explain this much better than, than uh, me and my collaborators who are material scientists can do the same. But there's these new types of piezoelectric materials that are biocompatible, that are non-polluting, uh, that can decompose. And so you could take this, the technology itself is agnostic, so you could take it and build on it. And in fact, there were, um, when we ran smart oceans and in the network blue economy, uh, sort of convergence accelerator, there are people who are specifically interested in taking this technology and demonstrating that you can build, uh, uh, that you can build these um, sort of non-pollutant non uh, uh, sensors, both non-noise pollutant, but also uh, uh, sort of the, the material itself is non-pollutant. Okay, um, so I'll read the next question. Um, is from Ryan. Um, I will read two. Uh, I'll do two more questions from the public chat, and then we will, we will let uh, Doctor Adip to to talk about the the, the questions sent to his uh, uh, his private chat. So the first um, the the first question is from Ryan. Uh, have have OTS ultrasound ones been considered for communication or charging for the uh, in body sensor? similar to the underwater application. Uh, so uh, can you please come again? Uh, Ryan is asking whether you have considered ultrasound um, for communication right, right. or charging. Yeah, so that's a great question. And actually existing technologies fall in multiple uh, categories. I'd say the vast majority are either near field or ultrasound. The challenge with these is that they require typically sort of a, a, a batch or sort of the power source on the human body. And they are good for a number of applications. One of the things that I have experienced when you actually like when um, like taking technologies and commercializing them in the in the real world is the ability of building user friendly technologies is super important for impact. And so our ability to be able to take the sensor and put it at a distance from the body opens up so many more applications and people will be much more comfortable with these and the adoption will be much more than if you put a sensor on the body. But I mean, again, sort of these uh, uh, near field, there's near field, there's also mid field, which have been used for a lot of number of scientific applications. They will have their application, 
But the fact that they are limited or they require body contact is going to limit their adoption. And so for this specific type of technology, we're, we're thinking about how you can open it up to a new applications, sort of a network of sensors inside, inside the body um, uh, looking forward. Um, I think you might be on mute, by the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't notice that. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. So the, the last question from the public chat, uh, before we switch, in, we switch to private chat, is from, again, from the far. The RFID used in closed boxes have been in use for many years for location of its content. So for a robotics application, you have added provisions of sensing along with navigation uh, control with its arm. Am I right? Uh, okay, this is a good question. So I did not go into a lot of details. So RFID is a mature technology. Actually, uh, the or the origins of RFID um, date back to the uh, to the original Auto ID Lab, um, and the vision was to, for automation in supply chain. And over the past few years, the researchers have really brought down the 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 uh, the power consumption made it the cost is now like three cents which is which has what enabled widespread adoption what we've done is the first thing that we've done is we've demonstrated the ability of localizing rfid tags with high precision so for example if you take this rfid rather than today's reader the vast majority of today's reader which can only detect if the rfid is within radio range um, we're able to uh, we're able to uh, locate it with high precision, so we're, we get centimeter scale positioning for RFIDs. And in fact, what we've demonstrated is that you can compute time of flight on off-the-shelf tags, which was something that people did not think were possible um, using uh, off the sort of using off-the-shelf tags. Um, but and because we're able to locate them with very high precision now you can combine the ID with the accurate location in order for you to tell a robot where, where to go ahead and pick up an item. And then we, we took it a step further and we combined it. We did fusion with vision, building on the many advances in uh, sort of vision-based deep learning over the, the past, uh, uh, over the past uh, five to, to 10 years and showed that by combining these together, you can enable things that were never possible before whether it's uh, using RFID alone or whether it's using vision alone. And this is super exciting because like we've shown picking, but now you can imagine so many other types of, uh, so many other types of uh, uh, applications in manipulation, uh, grasping, uh, verification, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Adib, uh, I think you mentioned that there are questions sent you to through private chat. Uh, can you share your, your answer to those questions? Yes. So actually, a lot of these were also sent, I think, to you or to everyone. So I will try to take especially questions from folks who have not uh, asked. So Phil, uh, Phil Falcon asks, um, would an acoustic GPS style network be portable in the oceans? Uh, and the answer to that actually is yes. And, and Underwater GPS is an open problem, and there's been many proposals. In fact, in one of our recent papers, we showed that it is possible to use these batteryless sensors as anchors. So again, what we showed is that you could use these sensors to communicate, but now since you can communicate, you can also use them to compute, like to measure distance and, and compute time of flight. And once you can measure distance and compute time of flight, you can now use them for acoustic localization. And so that opens up a lot of applications and people have been considering uh, underwater acoustic GPS for a while. What we're proposing now is you can make it even batteryless, so you can have these anchors last for uh, a long period of time. So there is another question also from John Wang. Uh, the question is, how much information can be transmitted by the underwater sensors and what would be the bottleneck for such bandwidth? Um, there's really, uh, there's a lot to unpack here, actually. Uh, so. Talking about uh, underwater sort of backscatter, we've shown that you could transmit 20 kilobits per second. So if you can transmit 20 kilobits per second, that that even pays way for people to be able to record and transmit sound, uh, record and transmit images, or even uh, or even build cameras uh, underwater. What typically limits the bandwidth is that the underwater chan acoustic channel is relatively narrow band. But there's also been so much work in this um, in sort of information theoretic work, work for 
underwater acoustic communication. And there are new questions that will arise today is once you also take power into account uh, for these energy harvesting sensors, what is the capacity of these uh, of these channels? And I think a lot of these are are going to still be open problems that I'm very much looking forward to seeing uh, the answers for over the next few years. Uh, before we have time for one final uh, questions, I noticed Randy has his hand raised. So, uh, Randy, I actually enable. So you can uh, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, so have, have, I'm curious about any durability studies that you might have done because you know the 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 ocean water is is. Uh, Quite reactive with with the many materials. Um, so so have you look, explored that aspect of it? And then in terms of acoustics, uh, there's there's a you know pretty broad band that you know wildlife uh, uh, whales for example use uh, quite different uh, parts of the spectral. Have you looked at the interference of the different uh, aquatic life or marine life and different sensing solutions? Um. Both great questions. Thank you for asking them. So the first one is about durability. Because we're building on piezo transducers, which actually have been around for, I mean, the, the way to communicate underwater is using a piezoelectric transducers. And so we're repurposing these piezoelectric transducers for, um, uh, for, uh, 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 for backscatter. And in that sense, we can build, and again, the rich li literature that has already ruggedized these transducers over so many years. And we have a specific ongoing project now with uh, collaborators at uh, HUI, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, on specifically ruggedizing these types of sensors and testing them. Uh, the second question is, how does this impact interference? This is another important question. Uh, and the repercussions of it is that it will really arise in choosing uh, the best uh, the best frequency for operation since the technology itself is pretty um, is pretty agnostic to the exact frequency you can determine the the desirable frequency based on um, based on uh, aquatic life and as I mentioned you might even be able to build wideband transducers to also harvest energy from it because it's such low power and it can even be pushed to the nanowatt so now you can even power up using these these acoustic uh, uh, sort of uh, using the sounds and hopefully not interfere with them. Okay, uh, due to time limitation, I'm sorry we can cannot take any more st uh, questions. Um, thank you, Professor Adi, for this very exciting uh, talk, and uh, and uh, also a big thank you to all the participating cha uh, Comsoc chapters. And most importantly, I need to thank everybody, thank all of you for attending this this event. This 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 event is is, is great. I, I really like the the interactions in the in the Q and A uh, sessions. Um, there are some questions regarding whether this video will be posted. Um, so I have already received a copy of the slides from Professor Adib, and he's he's also agreed to to share uh, the video. Um, uh, he also allowed me to to record the video and share the video uh, to all the to everybody that who registered to this event. So after this, once my computer um, finished processing everything, I will uh, I will send an email to everybody and with a link to the recorded uh, session. Uh, it's archived for for replay at your convenience. Because I also know that there are some people from West Coast, they could not make it, although they registered for the event. Um, also, uh, I, in order to, to help us uh, organize better uh, future sessions, I sent a link in the chat. That's a, uh, that's a brief survey. So please, please help us improve by completing the, the online uh, survey. So I guess uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you and thank you for joining and for hosting me and for everyone for the great questions and for your time today.
All right. Thank you. Thank you.